Good morning, OGC. We welcome you to our service this morning. Hopefully you're listening in on WOCO or on YouTube, and we're grateful that you're here today. Uh, we are in our next installment on the Messianic Psalms. Remember Messianic, the Christ in the Psalms and how they play out in the New Testament. Today is Psalm 110. We entitled it, The Exalted Lord. Now this is another prophetic message from David that describes David would not only be uh, the Messiah's son, but his Lord. And that descendant would be both king and a priest. David was a prophet. And in this psalm, he revealed new information from God concerning the future. So before we go into Psalm 110, let's ask the Spirit to open our hearts and minds to his word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open us up to understand this prophetic psalm, that we would find encouragement of knowing that you are the Son of God, that you are the Messiah, that you are the King. And Lord God, as we look at this today, that you would help us to be encouraged and to encourage others with this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you look at Psalm 110, verse 1, and I'll just read it for you. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and I will make your enemies a footstool, a footstool for your feet. Now, if you read the rest of the psalm, there's a conversation going on. And David heard this conversation between Yahweh and David's master. Could you imagine being in that place where you heard this conversation between Yahweh, God, and Adonai, the Christ, the Messiah? What an earful he received and heard. It was prophetic. So let's see what he says. Notice what it says, the Lord says to my Lord. We, what we see here is Christ is both David's son and Lord. How can that be? Uh, another translation of that would be, Jehovah says to my Adonai, is the way the psalmist opens this up, and David was the highest ruler of the kingdom, and his Adonai had to be the Lord himself. In fact, that Jesus presented this very thing to the Pharisees in Matthew 22, 41 through 46, asking them how David's Lord could also be the son or David's son, the Messiah. If you have your Bibles, just turn to Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And what we find here is the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the leaders of Herod were asking him questions. And now at the end of all this, Jesus has his own question. Listen to what he says. What do you think about the Christ? He's addressing those men. Whose son is he? They replied, the son of David. He said to them, how is it that, that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, and here he references Psalm 110, verse 1, that we're reading, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, he says in verse 45, If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? That's a riddle. And notice the response. No one could say a word in reply. From that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So what does Jesus do here in this verse? He, he turns the tables and asks this penetrating question. They all agreed that, yes, uh, the Messiah will be uh, of David's descent. But what they didn't understand, it would be God himself. That blew their mind. So just looking at this passage here, what do we see? The superiority of Christ to David is certainly made or revealed here, affirmed. But also we see Christ, 
deity as Lord is also affirmed. Now, if you go on and throughout the New Testament, you will find the identity of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of the Lord, spoken of here in verse 1 of Psalm 10, but also spoken throughout the scripture. And starting at the very beginning of Matthew's gospel, what does he do? He reveals, confirms the prophecy of David, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ is his position. He is Messiah, the son of God, the son of David, the son of Abraham. See, every Jew expected the Messiah to be from the line of David. But notice that he starts that, he starts that and says to them that he's the son of David, but also the son of Abraham, meaning that Abraham had these promises from God, and Jesus was the fulfillment of those promises. Now again, we see in Matthew 9.27. It's a story of the two blind men. And in these two blind men uh, showed great faith and an initiative to asking Jesus to do something for them. They're crying out. It says here in Matthew 9, 27, and Jesus left the house. He was followed by two blind men crying out, mercy, son of David, mercy on us. These two blind guys knew who he was. So they called out They loud, very loudly. If you turn to the book of Acts, Peter began to speak in Acts chapter 10, 34 through 36 about his experience at Cornelius' home. Remember, Cornelius was a Gentile. And remember, Peter was a devout Orthodox Jew. And he was not about to be going to a Gentile's home until God revealed something to him and showed it to him in a vision. He was in a trance. And no, notice what he says in verses 34 through 36. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. It confirms what uh, David's prophecy, the Lord says to my Lord, or Jehovah says to my Adonai. We also see Psalm 110 was also widely used in the New Testament as a testimony to Christ's resurrection and exaltation. You'll have to go to Acts chapter 5, 29-32. Here's Peter speaking. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you have killed by hanging him on a tree. What a bold statement. It said those who would be filled with the Holy Spirit would be full of boldness. Notice what he says in verse 31. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. And it says here in 32, we are witnesses of these things. So is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, turn to Acts chapter 7, 55 through 56. Stephen, before he's stoned, because of blasphemy, he says he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he says, look up, he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. There again, Stephen affirmed the prophecy of David when he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Here is Paul. At Romans 8.34, who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. Think of that. 
my Lord, Jehovah, says to Adonai, there is a confirmation for us. See, the most important question you or I will ever have to answer is what we believe about Christ. What do you believe about Christ? Who is he to you? Other theological questions are irreverent, are irreverent, irrelevant until we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And who is he? Do you believe that he is Savior? Do you believe that he is Messiah? Do you believe that he is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is God? Those are questions that you need to answer if you are still uh, on the edge or looking in and wondering, is this who Jesus is? Is this this man who walked on this earth for 33 years? Is he really the son of God? Is he really God? Is he really Lord Adonai? You'll need to answer those questions for yourself because that's what David says. The Lord says to my Lord. Remember, that's a conversation he's hearing. And so now let's look at that next part. Christ will be exalted by Jehovah. Psalm 110, verse 1 again. Notice the second part of it. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies under uh, enemies under your feet. They put your enemies under your feet. Now, now we talked a little bit about him putting his enemies under his feet. We talked about him being Lord. We talked him being Adonai. We talked about that Jesus uh, is greater than David, greater than than King David, even greater than Abraham. And see what he says here. So when we think of it, when Christ ascended into heaven and received honor was the fact that he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, what does that mean? Now, think of it. If you were in the days of a king, the king would be on his throne. And who would ever be on his right hand would be an honored person. It would be someone who is really great to be sitting at the right hand of a king. Well, here is Jesus sitting into heaven, sitting at God's right hand. God's on the throne. Jesus is on his right hand. The Old Testament, as we just said, speaks of this. And we see it, and I'll read it again for you. For you. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. See, when Christ ascended back into heaven, he re received the fulfillment of this promise found in Hebrews 1.3. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Think about that welcoming into the presence of God and Jesus sitting at God's right hand. What does that mean? That his work, his accomplishment of his work has been fulfilled. The redemption. You know, it'd be just like you or me or, or you finish a project. And it's something that you're really proud of. So that after you're finished with it, you sit down and you may look at it. And you are pleased at what you did. Well, this is what Jesus is doing. He's just sat at the right hand of God visibly demonstrating that his work of redemption was completed. Think of that, your redemption. His redemption for you is available to you. All you need to do is reach out, seek him. Because see, God had to pay for sin. God hated sin. It was an offense of his righteousness, his holiness, and his justice. But it was completed for you and for me. Now, in addition to showing that, the completion of Christ's work of redemption, the act of sitting down at the right hand also signaled this. He had authority over the universe. Now, do you remember in Psalm 2, verse 8? It says, ask of me and I will make the nations uh, as your inheritance and the earth as your possession. So it all, and Paul expands on this in Ephesians chapter 1, 20 and 21. Think about it. Here he's not only uh, has the nations as his inheritance and the earth as possession, 
but he has authority over the whole universe. Listen to what he says. God raised him from the dead and made him sit at the right hand of the heavenly places. Far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named. That's the authority that he has. He has finished everything, completed the redemption, but also he has full authority over the universe. That, that should blow our minds. Don't think that he has all authority of the whole universe. Peter says this in 1 Peter 3.22. Peter says that, that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, the authorities, and the power subjected to him. Wow. Now listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Paul also alluded to first, uh, Psalm 110, verse 1, but he also, in this quote that he uses, he also brings in Psalm 8, verse 6. It says, you made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put it under put everything under his feet. So here Paul says, he combines these two verses together, and he says, Christ must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. What does Paul mean by that? Well, you got to go back to verse 24, where he said there are two things that are going to happen. Two things are going to take place. He's going to put all his enemies under his feet. Who are the enemies? Sin and death. Think about that. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more death. But it also says that he will put all the hostile powers opposing God's will. He will overthrow them. Yes, and that's what it says here. If you look at Psalm 110, verses 5 through 7, he says, The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush the kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations heaping upon the dead, crushing the rulers, the whole earth. He will drink from the brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Wow. That's exactly what's going to take place. But what's the second thing that's going to take place according to 1 Corinthians 15, 24? And he will hand all his rule to God the Father. He'll be complete. But there's one other additional fact that we need to see about Christ's authority sitting at the right hand of God. It was the authority to pour out the Holy Spirit on the church. Peter says on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see in here. So speaking of what took place on the day of Pentecost, but think about it for you. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. That's why Paul can say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to you don't have to say, oh, Lord, oh, fill me with your own. Now walk in that. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be obedient to his word. You'll be obedient to what he asks you to do. You're filled with the Spirit because you can't live the Christian life without being filled with his Spirit. Wow. All these things we learned today about my Lord says, let's read it again. The Lord says to my Lord, Jehovah says to my Adonai, oh, it's confirmed that he is the son of David. And it confirmed that he is the Messiah, Adonai. And then we looked at that last part. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And how he's going to crush his enemies. So what do we take away from this? What is it that we need to understand is this. Jesus, Messiah, Son of God and Lord, understands us. He understands you and he understands me. And he knows what we need. 
And, and Jesus' authority, his, his power and authority of all we've talked about here in Psalm 110 isn't just for some future event. We know the, the, the event that David was speaking of was confirmed in the New Testament, but also it will be confirmed again as we see Christ at the right hand of God the Father. All these things will happen. But the Hebrew writer tells us that we don't have to wait for the future event, but he is exercising his right right now. He's our priest. That's what it says here in this psalm, that he is our priest. Oh, that is something that we need to remember. It says in uh, Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord is sworn and will not change. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He is your priest. He is your Lord, Messiah. Listen to what the Hebrew writer says, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, Jesus identified with us by taking on human flesh in his first coming, so he understands firsthand your temptations. Can you imagine? When you're being tempted, he knows this. He knows when you're being tempted. That's why he says to call out to him. He understands what you're going through. Don't try to hide it from him. We are all tempted in many different ways. Our personalities, our, uh, who we are, we are tempted differently, but it's still the same thing. We're tempted to sin, and our flesh is weak. And when we talk about weaknesses, boy, you could talk about all kinds of weaknesses, but remember, he understands if you're addicted to drugs, that's a weakness. That's something that you just can't get over with. Let me tell you, Jesus understands you where you are right now, and he can deliver you from that. If you're addicted to alcohol, that's a weakness. Don't hide it from him. Don't store your alcohol in, in different places so that you have a place to, to drink, whether it's out in the barn or where, wherever you do it. God understands. Don't hide it from him. See, when you think of it, your perfect and compassionate high priest, and let me read verse, verse 4 again, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He is listening to you today. Bring to him your deepest need. Again, remember who he is, the exalted Lord, the Son of God, Adonai, he is yours. Reach out to him today. Talk to him. Tell him what you need. And maybe today is a day you need to bow your knee to Jesus Christ. Just remember there, there's, there are going to be those who are going to be under his feet, in his enemies. He's giving you an opportunity to repent, to believe, to have your life changed. So that's you today. Seek him. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray for those who are listening that maybe today is a day that they would see who you are as, as Adonai, as God, the son of David, that all these things are true. Help us. Help those who are sitting here right now or listening that they will turn their hearts to you and confess their sins and receive you. 
as Savior and Lord and live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.